tonight, let's turn our attention to uh, part of the, uh, the program, which is a, a key part and component of it. Uh, and I have the privilege of having a longtime friend, Gerilyn Dodds, uh, present tonight uh, some of her experiences, art and experience, uh, uh, and the exotic. That she, she had to put that exotic element because she always is interested in exotic interchanges between uh, art and society and ideology in, in medieval Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, whether it be from the uh, Al Andalus side, uh, the Islamic side, and her long time interested in art and ideology, especially through architecture uh, in this field uh, over many years. We've collaborated on a number of uh, projects, and uh, including a little bit on a film uh, that was on the road to Santiago de Compostela, which is really short but very evocative. And uh, the images tell an awful lot uh, in, that, in, that, uh, in that film. Uh, her, uh, just without going into all of her great publications, uh, just to cite her most recent uh, publication as a co-author on uh, the arts of intimacy, Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the making of Castilian culture, uh, something that she collaborated on with colleagues at Yale University and published by Yale Press um, uh, this last year. So tonight, she'll turn her attention uh, to art and experience and the exotic on the road to Santiago de Compostela. And I see I've already starting to erase some of her imagery here, but I think she's going <laughs> to move, move on, and I hope not to erase the experience because it's going to be <laughs> exhilarating. Uh, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Let's see. Now I'm going to see if we, you know, all of us have become rather foolish trying to figure this out. This is a high, it says clear. Oh, amazing. All right. The, um, the image we see that you see before you is an image of two pilgrims standing before the facade of the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela as it stands today. And um, there is a lively pilgrimage today. And one of the reasons Chuck asked me to do this is that I was going to do part of the pilgrimage on foot this summer, and I wasn't able to for um, some <coughs> health reasons. But I'm going to do it this June. And I, it, I started to think, what were the differences and what were the common points of the experience of a pilgrim in the Middle Ages when the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela was conceived and today. But there are some things that are actually very much the same. That when you break yourself off from your community and you walk a long way to go someplace, actually, you can get plenary dispensation. That means you can, you can have a pretty much clean slate um, of your sins if you walk 100 kilometers or by horseback, which I think it sounds like it's cheating. <laughs> Finding a place to put your horse nowadays might be arduous enough to, to, merit, to, to, to merit it. So, but it's not so much the idea that you, that you receive for the pilgrimage some kind of dispensation for your sins, but that you actually have a cathartic experience while you're doing it. Now, in the Middle Ages, that experience was quite a bit more intense. People were very much um, enclosed in their communities. Um, even if you lived uh, in a city, but especially if you lived in a small agricultural, um, a small agricultural community, you knew your confessor your entire life. It is today, if, you, if you're Catholic and you want to confess and you have something particularly juicy, you don't have to confess to your parish priest. You can go take the subway across town and find another priest <laughs> who doesn't know you. But in the Middle Ages, there was a, your confessor was, was a, might very well be a, par, a part of your life. Um, you might know who it was you were going to marry from the time you were 10 or 11. So you, ha you lived in a very um, holding community, but you also lived in a rather claustrophobic community. And pilgrimage was a very valid way of moving out of that. And so th the process of pilgrimage is seen as one in which you, you, you separate yourself from the place where you have this identity, and then you go into a liminal state, a state which is neither here nor there, not your home, but not the, the, the goal of your journey yet. And in that liminal space, you get vulnerable. I mean, you can imagine when you know, you're not at home and you're not the place you're going yet, you, you, you've lost a lot of those touch points. And especially in the Middle Ages, because a pilgrimage had a great many more unknowns, hardly any communication, and, um, and many, many real dangers. So that liminal state, you're very, very you're very vulnerable and very ready for spiritual experiences. I mean, if you've had one of those experiences of climbing a mountain 
or going someplace where you didn't have your cell phone. You know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I have a spiritual experience if I'm without my cell phone for half a day. But, is it, but it, so if, you, if you have one of those experiences climbing a mountain, you know you feel you're, you're disconnected, you feel, you feel vulnerable. And those were the experiences in which the monuments and the images of the pilgrimage really had this enormous impact on people. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say experience. So these two backpackers looking at the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela might not have had the same level of experiences. Yeah. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Might not have, I see there's feedback. Might not have ha had the same level of experiences as people in the Middle Ages, but they're having something of that disconnect and that reconnection. And so there in the Baroque facade of the cathedral, we see the image of St. James. Now, St. James appears here as a pilgrim. And that's a problematic thing that we'll talk about later. He's a pilgrim with a pilgrim's leather hat, a staff, and he has and he has shells. He has a big leather purse, which is sort of a satchel where you carried the things that you needed for the pilgrimage. And, um, and he has these shells. And the shell is the way that you identify a pilgrim to Santiago. Um, here at Autun in France, um, this is actually a, a scene of the Last Judgment. And here are some people who are going to be saved. And one of them, this one, is a pilgrim to Rome. And he has his satchel with the cross on it, meaning that he's a pilgrim to Rome. And the other one, this one, is a pilgrim to Santiago. And he's marked by that, um, by that scallop shell. It's a scallop shell because Santiago, um, by the way, Santiago is Santiago, Iago meaning James. Santiago de Compostela, St. James of the Field of Stars. Um, there are, many, there are actually other interpretations now on the derivation of that, of that word, which I won't burden you with. I think you've had a number of people talk about it. But it's this place from the westernmost um, <coughs> limits of northern Spain and very, very close, to the, very, very close to the sea. So people would go and gather shells as a kind of souvenir and as a kind of proof that they'd been, to, that they'd been on the pilgrimage. And the proof. Um, is here, and now you can say you can get one with a sort of tacky sticker of the, of the cathedral facade on the inside, and you can even buy a gourd. Now, in the Middle Ages, a gourd is how people would carry water, and they don't do that anymore, but the gourd now, the gourd and the shell, even for modern pilgrims, have become part of, have become part of the symbol, and that's another part of the experience. Not so much the symbols, but the carrying these symbols or carrying these talisman become a way that you create a new community. You separate yourself from your old community. You're in this vulnerable, liminal state. And then you become one with the community of pilgrims. And these shells or staffs or gourds, even today when they don't really serve uh, an enormous purpose, you can take pictures of St. James. You don't need to bring back a shell. You certainly don't want to drink your water out of that gourd. But, but still, they help to bind you, right? They help their, their symbols and talismans that help to bind you to a new kind of community. And that's the community of pilgrims. So the idea of this community is um, reinforced in a number of ways. One of the first ways it's reinforced is, if, of course, if you actually go in a group. And if you go to Santiago, it's actually very, it's very, very, um, very moving to go to Santiago de Compostela today because all you have to do in the summer is sit in the square and you watch group after group come in who have actually done part of it on foot. And sometimes people fall to their knees and pray. And sometimes they're just football clubs and they sing their football song. <laughs> really, you know, you know something, they're secular, they're now secular pilgrims, they're cultural pilgrims. But everybody feels this, in, there, you can see there's a kind of elation in, 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 in reaching there. And the elation comes not just from the experience of doing it together, like this group you see on the lower left, but the elation also comes from the fact that you overcome a kind of monotony kind of arduous, uh, uh, an, ardu an arduous journey. And the, the feeling of overcoming that, and also overcoming obvious dangers or overcoming physical limitations, adds to your feeling that it's spiritual. So this turns out to be a spiritual thing for people who aren't particularly religious. Imagine in the Middle Ages what it must have been like. So this map, which those of you who have been to a number of these lectures have probably seen 17 times, this map 
traces some of the ways that people came to Santiago de Compostela. And so Santiago is, of course, right here. This is where you gather the, uh, this is where you gather the, the, uh, the scallop shells. Um, a lot of these roads here are Roman roads uh, that became more populous for the pilgrimage, but also a lot of them are roads that served local pilgrimages. Because another part of pilgrimage is that you don't just take a long trip to get to the end, but you have you have you have smaller versions of that trip on the way. You have smaller spiritual experiences leading to one bit one big one in the end. Now you can understand that pilgrimage was something which was um, quite enthusiastically supported by the church, both the church as a whole, the papacy, and by the different churches on the way, because people came and, and uh, adored their relics. Um, people with means left money. People without means helped to increase the, 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 the renown of that place um, and, it, and, its, and its value. And also what happens is these churches built along the way, or the churches helped to I'm going to say help to co-opt or help to make sure that the experience of pilgrimage remained one under the umbrella of the church. And we have something really interesting that happens in this church. I'm going to go here and then I'm going to come back. Oh, yes, okay. Hi. Medievalists are on the whole technically challenged. <laughs> this church, which you see there, that church is saint Foy at Conque. It was a church that had its own pilgrimage, and then its pilgrimage was incorporated also into the pilgrimage to Santiago. But um, at the Church of Saint Foy, for instance, uh, pilgrims were coming and staying there. They were very encouraged. It was big. The church was made larger. It, it was made having to have a kind of great circulation to accommodate a large number of of of, of, um, of pilgrims. And at one point. Um, actually having to do not with the pilgrimage of Santiago, I think so much as the pilgrimage to saint Foy. At one point, um, a letter was written complaining of the fact that at night there were sort of jugglers and entertainers. And at night, you would have the pilgrims who were staying in the church would sing at night. Or they would sing secular songs. And in the end, it was decided not to get too upset about it. Now, you know, what you're seeing is a way of a, something which had become a powerful popular movement. And the church decided that they wanted to embrace it as much as possible so that these emotions and these feelings and these actions would be seen as part of the world, the sort of part of this sort of divine cosmos, part of the world controlled by the church, and that the catharsis that people would feel would ultimately be seen as part of their, um, as part of their religious feeling and part of their uh, and part of their experience as regards the church. The church worked hard um, in, in many times, uh, not just at the times that, that, that constitutes the center of the pilgrimage of Santiago, to increase that sense of uh, emotional catharsis. And one of the ways was by enclosing the relics in gorgeous and quite um, sumptuous, quite miraculously sumptuous materials. Now you have to understand that people are not going on the pilgrimage to see art and architecture. And of course it's one of the things we forget because often when we go on pilgrimage we go to see the art and the architecture. But in fact people were going to see relics, holy bodies. These holy bodies were the means by which miracles happened. And the pilgrim's guide that those of you who have been to these lectures before have heard about was one of, was one of the means uh, of, of our understanding that. Now, however, for these holy bodies to seem really amazing, really, mirac really miraculous, they could be enclosed in gold. And this is the child saint, Saint Faith Saint Foy at Conque. And she's, her, um, her relic is, in, is sort of re, is, is enclosed in a, um, is, is, in, is enclosed in a, kind of, in a kind of box that's shaped like her sitting on a throne. So Saint Foy, who was supposed to have been a little girl who defied the Romans, now becomes a kind of a ruler sitting on a throne. And she's covered with gold and jewels, actual things that people donated. So if you donated your earrings and they had a really good cameo, they were just kind of, you know, they, they, were, they were just kind of embedded in this gold. And the more there was, the more 
miraculous it was. There's a wonderful book by a man named Conrad w Rudolph, and he talks about how people measured the miraculousness of the relic in some ways by, the, by, by, by how eye-popping the gold and, and the jewels were. But remember that we're in a time, not only was there no television or, 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 or no newspapers, <laughs> there, weren't, there, weren't image, there weren't public images of any kind, or there were very, very few public images and so in the, in the earliest period, um, a relic like this processed out of the church had an enormous power. These images were, were, were enormously powerful, and that power was primarily in the hands of the church. So a pilgrim would come to a place like Sainte Foy at Conque, and um, the monumentality of the building, um, the message of the sculpture, in this case it's a pretty straightforward one, anyone could read it, hell and heaven, um, good and bad. I want to point out something too, because we're going to get to it later. This is Charlemagne. Charlemagne is just making it into heaven. I'll explain why later. But he has, <laughs> but he's being, he's sort of being, he's, somebody's got him by the hand. And he's being, he's, he's being, he's being drawn in. So heaven is this extremely, um, heaven is this extremely ordered place. Hell is this not only horrific place because of the tortures, but it's a very disorderly place. And of course, if you look at heaven, it's like the cross section of a church. So the message is very clear. It's very readable on a lot of levels that you, know, you come into the church, you're obedient to the church, and things, things are pretty much worked out for you. And if you look at some of these people, they're not all only the regular adulterers here, but here's a, here's a knight falling off his horse. We know actually that there was a knight who had uh, fallen off his horse uh, early in the history of Conk, and people wonder if that's not actually a contemporary, a contemporary reference. But whether it is or not, the key is that Saint Foy, the little girl here who's also on, on that tympanum, is now appearing as a great authority. So pilgrimage has a very personal aspect to it, an extremely personal, emotional, even psychological aspect to it. And that is being structured as much as possible by the church as an institution. So some of the ways, how do you increase um, and redouble the kind of commitment that pilgrimage gives to people? Because people came back from pilgrimage um, with, with, with more ardor, with more religious ardor and more spiritual ardor. And one of the ways was to remind people that the sort of cosmic stories of the Bible, the stories um, the story of, of Christ, the stories of the <coughs> great struggle between good and evil or between, um, between Christ and Satan are happening today as well. And the things that happen today are part of cosmic history and you are within it. So what are some of the things that are happening in the period that we're talking about? If we go back, say, to the 12th century, some of the things that have happened recently are, of course, the Crusades, um, going to that place, the Holy Land, where there is certainly another pilgrimage, a pilgrimage that people haven't been able to make too easily for, for a while, um, recapturing uh, the great sites of Christ's um, passion and, and, and life, and um, and, uh, and, and, fr and freeing them for, for, for Christians. And this is a, a, a later, um, a very famous later mini miniature of the Crusaders besieging <coughs> the Holy Land. And you can see that this building, some people think these are stained glass windows, some people think that these are sort of um, a kind of memories for people. It, are, the sign, are the passions happening in the buildings? Is it people believe People believed when they went to a place like Santiago or when they went to Jerusalem that not only are they at the site where very holy things happened, where very holy bodies exist, but they bring you closer to those times. You can remember them or imagine them or you can, you, 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 you can create the memory better if you are in the place where that's happening. Now, um, the thing about the uh, Crusades is that um, the Crusades present people with a paradigm for evil. It wasn't, of course, a real paradigm for evil, but it was a good enough one, which is the idea of Muslims having the Christian sites in their hands. Of course, we know that in 1099, when the Crusaders took Jerusalem, they weren't asking anybody if they were a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew before they were killing them. There were quite a few, quite a few Christian 
Chris Christians in Jerusalem were killed, indigenous Christians and indigenous, indigenous Jews as well. But the idea, the exegetical literature suggests that, you know, Muslims, su Muslims suggest the Antichrist, Muslims suggest, um, su su suggest the, kind of, the kind of worst threat to the domain of Christ. So the Crusaders are, are fighting a, a kind of cosmic battle of good and evil. So then what we have is we have an attempt to fold this into the experience of pilgrimage. Another French monument, another French monument that was on the pilgrimage roads to Santiago, but which um, also had its own pilgrimage is this one there. Well, I'm probably not using the right thing. Oh, yeah, I wasn't. Look, there, that one. Oh, look, it's so great. There, Lupuy, okay? The Church of Lupuy. And if I don't go clear, it'll go in. The Church of Lupuy. Now, Lupuy is interesting because it was also the, um, it was also the site of uh, a great bishop, Ademar of Lupuy, who was one of the, um, who was one of the first, who was one of the originators of the, fir of the First Crusade. And when you go to Lupuy, you can see how this might be a great pilgrimage site as well. Um, fabulous, uh, fa fabulous chapel up on, on, on a pinnacle, and a cathedral as well on a very high hill. Here's the little chapel of Saint-Michel uh, de Guy. De Guy is this, um, this uh, needle-like like, like outcrop. <laughs> And when you go to the top of it, of course, it's a pilgrimage in itself. So you have pilgrimages within pilgrimages within pilgrimages. You have, even if you just go to Le Puy, you do a kind of mini pilgrimage, a long, a long passageway, very circuitous. And when you get there, you see this. A lot different from the tympanum we saw at St. Foy at Conque. Doesn't have <coughs> large images, but has some rather rare small images. And it has a lot of overall surface decoration. It's very, very unusual. And when we look at the Cathedral of Le Puy, um, vastly restored and reconstructed in the 19th century, but still the main thing that we're looking at is it has a pretty, it's a pretty good image, this kind of wild and wonderful use of polychromy, of black and reddish stone um, alternating with white. Now, this, I would suggest, both of these, were considered to be exotic. So what is the role of the exotic? Well, it's probably true that at Le Puy, they're, not, they're thinking of this building. Now, why would they think of the Dome of the Rock? Well, the Dome of the Rock is, of course, a building built by Muslims in the seventh century in Jerusalem. But for the Crusaders, the Dome of the Rock was, even for the ones who knew better, everybody was, <laughs> Pretty much everybody was sticking to the story that the Dome of the Rock was actually the temple of the temple of the Lord. Some people thought it was the site of the Temple of Solomon or the temple where at which Christ was presented, the presentation at the temple, and that had been taken over uh, by the Muslims and, and that now they were restoring it and making it a Christian church under the Crusaders. Um, what that means is, is that the idea of this polychrome masonry, this alternating, uh, these alternating voussoirs, which we call them right here, in, um, a, in, a building, in a building like this becomes part of, a kind of, a, a, kind of a, a kind of exotic sign of a site where many amazing things had happened in, um, in the Crusades. And I promise we're going to get back to Santiago. But of course, when you look at that masonry, at Le Puy, you might also think of this building, the Great Mosque of Cordoba. As a matter of fact, when you look at the little, uh, when you look at the little um, Saint Michel de Guy, that little portal up here, you might think of this kind of motif. Um, of course, the reason it's looking Islamic, Islamic light, that is, it's not in the Islamic style. It's not made by Islamic craftsmen. But what makes it look Islamic is there's an attempt to create something that has this look of a portal which is designed around abstract principles. Because of, because of course, in Islamic buildings, you can't have um, central figural imagery, right? That would be trying to reproduce the, the, uh, trying to reproduce, uh, the work of God who creates men and animals and animate beings. So instead, you have these very, uh, you have these very complex, often geometric, um, aniconic 
um, decoration on architecture, a kind of decoration which, is, uh, which has a lot of small parts and which engages you more intellectually than as a narrative or than as a, um, or, or than as, as a story or with images of people. So we have to ask ourselves, wh how does this work at Le Puy? What's happening? There's some kind of an attempt to make reference to this grand battle. And even though a lot of these appearances relate to buildings that are built by Muslims, it's that relationship, it's that tag of, of Islam that gives it a kind of danger, gives it a kind of exoticism and reminds you that we're fighting the fight for the cosmos now. That you, in your vulnerable state, in your pilgrimage, you know, you're doing something, you're, 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 becoming, part of, you're becoming part of a fight uh, for good and evil, and, and this gives more meaning and more excitement, even a kind of tiny feeling of danger to, oh, oh, look, I did it again. Ah. Give even a tiny feeling of danger to your pilgrimage. So what's happening in Spain? Why is this, um, why is this something that's happening in Spain now? Well, of course, because Spain is divided into a lot of different small uh, countries, especially in the north, Galicia, Leon. And in the south, many of these countries in the beginning of this period, this, this map is 10, 6, 1065, it changes, but um, it, it has a lot of countries ruled by Muslims down, down below. But of course, the pilgrimage road goes along the top. The pilgrimage goes, goes along the top through lands that are ruled by Christian rulers, Galicia, Leon, Castile, Navarre, Aragon, and a little bit of, 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 of Catalonia. Um, so what's happening? The pilgrimage road is, is in lands that belong to Christian rulers, but, both, but the church is very interested in your feeling excited about it, as if your pilgrimage is part of a crusade. As a matter of fact, the church is really interested in considering fights against these, uh, these Muslim countries to the south to have them considered as a kind of crusade. The problem is a lot of these Muslim countries to the south already belong to the Christians and they don't really want to wipe them out. They're making a lot of money out of it. Toledo is very <laughs> soon in the hands of Castile. Um, uh, down here, Murcia. Murcia will, by the 13th century, be in the hands of Alfonso X, the king of Castile. Here he is with his Muslim subjects. And at the time, economically, it makes a lot more sense to have Muslim subjects than to kill them or make them convert. It's, it's, it, it, it makes a lot more sense. If there's a kind of sense of, of continuity. So there's a kind of struggle. Then there are these Jews and these Christians who speak Arabic, who have lived under the Muslims for a long time. It's really hard to have a bipolar opposition <coughs> in the south of Spain. You can't have bad Muslim, good Christians, all Muslims should die, all Christians should live. You can have Christians should rule, but it's hard to have this other thing because there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of ambivalence. The church, and in particular, the, um, the um, grand monastic establishments of France often don't see it that way. They don't understand why they can't create a lot of uniformity. And indeed, the grand monastic establishments in France are trying to getting control of the church of, 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 of the churches of Spain. And one of the ways they're doing it is through the pilgrimage. Um, this, is a, this is a Christian tombstone of a man named Michael, and the tombstone has a, an inscription in Arabic around the outside and in Latin in the center. This is a capital from a synagogue, and the inscription's in Hebrew here and Arabic on top. A lot of cultural ambivalence. So, so this part of the pilgrimage roads, the part that goes through the north of Spain, the part of the pilgrimage roads that go through the north of Spain was something that was already exotic to French people and English people, to people from Hungary, to people from, from all of the northern countries. It was already very exotic. It was, do you think we'll see a Muslim? Is this going to be exciting? Is it, you know, there was the, that part of the danger. And these little bits of exoticism reminded you of what an adventure you were having, how you were, in many ways, risking yourself. Um, this is the town of Puente la Reina, one of the great places mentioned in um, the Pilgrim's Guide. Uh, here's an image from the Pilgrim's Guide to remind you. This is the, a great a bridge that existed, actually described um, in the manuscript. It's a wonderful thing. And here's the river. 
which is supposed to be um, the river, which is supposed to be, I think this is one of the ones that's supposed to be, uh, that, that's supposed to be poisonous. It's not. <laughs> now, a lot of the churches that spring up along the road to provide these stops, these sort of mini experiences, <laughs> these mini uh, religious experiences, um, a lot of them are quite dull. Or, well, I mean, no Romanesque church is dull because Romanesque is the best style in the world. <laughs> That's for sure. But as Romanesque goes, it's rather, it's rather prosaic. This is the church of Fromista. It's a really nice little church. One of the stops mentioned in the Pilgrim's Guide on the Pilgrimage Road is built of ashlar masonry. It has uh, corbels and has many moldings over it. It's very plastic, very um, heavy. And on the inside, it's a very simple kind of church. You see there are no windows here, no clear story, only one level of elevation. Um, beautifully built, sturdily built, but um, but you know not always not always not always vibrating with specificity, and you know the, a lot of the churches that we look at look at in France were not built to serve the pilgrimage road in Spain. They were places that were already distinguished in their own right when they were integrated into this movement, but some of the ones in Spain were built to accommodate it. Among them is a little church, a very interesting this little church right here. Oh, Sorry, this there is this little church right there, a church at a place called Torres del Rio, and it was built by um, it was built by a religious order which was actually um, making its way into Spain, becoming actually quite powerful in Spain um, after leaving the Holy Land, and that's the Templars. And of course, this is a religious order of monks who were uh, who were allowed to fight, right? Who were allowed to to fight against non-Christians in order to gain, uh, the, um, to gain the places in the Holy Land. And these military orders are now moving into Spain um, and being part of this push, uh, which is now being taken up by some of the Spanish rulers, to start to think of the Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula as, uh, as, as worthy of a kind of crusade. So take a look at it. It's dedicated to the Holy Sepulcher. Now, um, we know what the Holy Sepulchre is. If this is the Dome of the Rock, which the Crusaders took to be um, the Temple of the Lord, and this is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which they took to be the Palace of Solomon on the whole, here was, over here, the, um, here was the Holy Sepulchre, um, uh, you know, sort of marked by its large dome. All you really needed to have, all you really needed to have a copy of the Holy Sepulchre was perhaps an octagon, or an octagon with a kind of ambulatory and a dome, and it kind of was a body double. That just didn't have to look like the Holy Sepulchre, and of course the way it looks today is not the way it looked then anyway. It didn't have to look like the Holy Sepulchre, but it had to have a kind of a, um, it, had, it had to be a kind of marker that was understandable. It had to be symbolically look like the Holy, Holy Sepulchre. But what's on the inside is interesting, because there's nothing like this dome at the Holy Sepulchre. This is actually a rib dome. It doesn't, it works like a rib vault in a, in a Gothic cathedral, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way in order to make height. It works that way because there's a kind of pleasure in an aesthetic of breaking <coughs> something up into geometric parts. Breaking something up into geometric part and creating a kind of rebus, a kind of puzzle that you can become engaged with. How do the parts fit together? How do you see them together? And of course, as I describe it, you should be saying that sounds a little bit like what we're saying about a lot of Islamic architectural decoration in this time. And indeed, this dome was a copy of a number of other domes. Probably not a direct copy of this one, which is the dome of the Great Mosque of Cordoba. Probably a copy of this one, which is the dome of a little oratory in a palace uh, built by the great, um, by the great uh, Muslim monarch al Mahmoun in Toledo, which at this time had been already taken over by the Castilians. So it was a recognizably, it was a recognizably um, Islamic type, both because of the way that it, it treats decoration, and also because people, you know, people knew these were. These, it was almost like a spoil of war in a way. You could think of it that way as well, that, that Castilians ruled Toledo. Castilians had the palace of al-Mahmoun now. 
So this style became a kind of resonant reminder of, 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 of this battle and of having overcome Muslims. So the notion, the notion of something exotic that reminds you of a contemporary war lets you think of the contemporary war as a kind of part of a cosmic battle, which is like the great, great battles of the Bible that you want to be part of. So, so, so cosmic history, divine history, didn't just happen in the past in the life of Christ. It's happening all the time. And you, as a pilgrim, are a kind of warrior. Now, the pilgrimage rose in Spain also gave birth to new towns. And these towns would be given things called fueros. Fueros were their own sets of laws. And it gave people certain rights. You know, we're still in the uh, 11th and 12th and 13th centuries in Spain, which is a, a time in which we have a kind of agrarian economy, a uh, kind of uh, royal rights and aristocratic rights. So for people in a town to be given special rights was un unusual. The people who were given special rights in this town on the pilgrimage road, which is a town called Estella, were Franks. Okay? So that a lot of French people were coming down, not just these not just these um, uh, monastic rulers, but other people who are coming down are coming down because they practice certain crafts, because they do certain kinds of trade. They're actually taking advantage of all the movement along the road. So there's a kind of economic movement as well. And the people given rights in this town were Franks and Jews. And the Jews are particularly important. They're uh, traders and money lenders. And that they're given particular rights in the Fueros of Estella is quite extraordinary here. And it tells us what a growth industry the pilgrimage roads were at this time. This is a church built for Estella, and it's called San Pedro de la Rua, which is St. Peter of the Road. It's, it's a specifically built for pilgrims uh, church, and it has its own little pilgrimage up to it. It's a little hard to get to. And when you look at it, you would say, well, how could this be considered exotic? Well, it was exotic actually in two ways. The first way that it was exotic is that it's rather French in its individual motifs, right? Its individual motifs, um, when, you, when you start to look at them, are kind of Gothic. But when you look at the whole, it's kind of unusual as well. I mean, where's that central image that we like to see, that central, that central sort of um, eschatological image? It's not there. There are a lot of motifs, but they're put together like this. Here's the portal from the Great Mosque of Cordoba in an abstract way. That is, they're not telling a story. They're not telling a narrative. When you look at the individual ones, there's nothing particular Islamic about it. There's a vine scroll. There's some little flowers. There's a billet molding. And yet, as a whole, as a whole, it looks what would have been considered Islamicizing and exotic. And actually, this thing here comes directly from the Holy Land. So once again, you conflate all Muslims, Spanish Muslims, Muslims in, uh, from the Crusades. It's all the same. Because what you're interested in is creating this bipolar opposition between you, and, between you and Muslims, something that puts you on the good side of the cosmic battle in your, in your trip. Um, these, are some of the, uh, these are some of the capitals from San Pedro de la Rua. And they're quite, they're quite funny. They're, these, are like, these are like griffins. You can see they have sort of Oh, look at this one has like a little bird's feet. And then they have um, a kind of lion's head. And they, have, um, and they have wings. And these are being copied off of something else that's coming there, which are beautiful, beautifully carved ivory boxes. Now, these ivory boxes were one of the most amazing things you could get in this period. It was, it, ivory, was, was, ivory was more valuable than gold. It came from, uh, it came, this ivory came from North Africa. And um, these, this one was made probably um, for uh, that same ruler in Toledo. And it has exactly these griffins in it. Um, it has some figures in it. It was from a palatial context, animals, griffins, the same motifs we find on these capitals. So there are two things happening. On one hand, you want to give that sense of the exotic, so you have a sense that you're involved in this um, heroic battle. But on the other hand, there is a residual admiration underneath it. Admiration for Islamic crafts, admiration for Islamic luxury arts, these things that were 
actually quite extraordinary. So people are, people are appropriating these and they're putting them in a context where they can look at them. I can look at this because it's reminding me of those bad Muslims. But in fact, there's also a kind of admiration there. Here's a, the palace in Estella, and the palace has a really amazing capital, a capital that shows a kind of joust here. And what it shows, as a matter of fact, is the death of the giant Faragat by Roland. And this is a story that's told actually in the, um, in the, uh, in, in the, um, I'm sorry, in the, <laughs> what? Well, tell me, come on, where? Thank you. Well, it's the Saga of Roland, but in particular as it's recounted, as it's recounted in the Codex Calixtinus, which is the codex that has the Pilgrim's Guide in it. And it's really interesting because that, as, 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 as Elizabeth Brown, as Professor Brown, who's sitting right here, told us a couple of, couple of, couple of weeks ago, there's a particularly hilarious rewriting of the Song of Roland to include St. James, um, to include um, to, uh, uh, to include St. James. And so sort of the French notion of the Song of Roland and the, the, the pilgrimage to Santiago and killing Muslims as a divine uh, a, 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 as, a, as, a, as a divine kind of work. All of those things are put together into um, one legendary story. And that's the story that's being told here. So, so it's very clear that the combination of this church, it's clear that the combination of this church and uh, of, this, of, 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 of this church and this palace are made to um, excite you with this, with this notion. Now there are also, as at the very um, extraordinary Church of Leon, also on the pilgrimage road, but a church that has the Church of San Isidoro, which has a, both a regal meaning and a, a long-standing me meaning on, um, uh, in Spain. There are also quite theological arguments that are created. And we're not going to go through the whole one here. But this is an argument that suggests this is the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham. Here's the hand of God saying, OK, you don't have to sacrifice him. I'm bringing you this lamb instead. But on either side are the, are the generations of Abraham. On one side, um, Sarah, good, and Isaac. And on the other side, this concubine, Hagar, who shows that she's not nice because she's lifting her skirt. <laughs> there, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and and so what the notion is, what the what the what the what the notion is, is that these are the chosen people who will become the Christians. These are the rejected people who will become the Muslims. Now, this was this was a fairly um, this was a fairly complex construct, and it was fairly it's a fairly com complex construct, and it's also uh, actually there's a really new good new theory about it. Um, the theory is, the new theory about it is that it was um, that it was ordered by the sister of King Alfonso VI, who was at one time uh, who was at one time a patroness of San Isidoro and Leon. And Alfonso VI, his, his his favorite wife was a former Muslim princess, and and his sister, who was rather <coughs> attached to him, didn't like that. I'm not sure that this is the case, but I thought it was time for some gossip. Um, <laughs> So, um, so, uh, so that's an attempt to actually create a theolog theological construct. And one wonders how many people understood that without, with, without a tour guide. So there, there are always there are kind of different levels of meaning that you could, that, that, that you could look at. But here's the, here's the statue of San Isidoro himself. And next to him is a little soldier with a, with, with a sword. Now, San Isidoro is like a late antique early Christian um, a great uh, philosopher. And, um, and this didn't enter in for him. But everything is being militarized. Everything is being militarized. And it becomes interesting for the rulers. It becomes interesting for the church. And then it heightens your experience and your sense of being part of something exciting. Well, on the whole, though, it wouldn't be these complex philosophical constructs which would work for the pilgrims. Instead, the pilgrims were provided with one particularly interesting and useful paradigm. Now, this paradigm was created probably as early as the, um, as the uh, 10th century 
but it really became big in the 12th century, and it became particularly big um, with the interaction of French clerics and Spanish clerics. And that's the idea of Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Moor Killer. Now, if you review, if you review what you know about St. James, and I, it took me a long time on Google today to find a St. James who wasn't, who wasn't Santiago Matamoros, let me tell you. Here's St. James. St. James is an apostle of Christ, which means that be, you know, he exists, be, he exists you know, a solid 600 years before the advent of Islam. So the idea of a St. James who rides a white horse with the dismembered bodies of Muslims under his horse's hooves does not fit in with our notion of who St. James was. And of course, there was a, a terrific amount of hagiography to explain how the body of St. James came to Spain. But of course, everybody knew it, it, it was there long before the advent of Islam. Um, this grows from a tradition that an early king who was fighting, uh, who was fighting, against, who was fighting against Muslims, Ramiro, had a dream. And in his dream, he saw St. James charging ahead of him on a white horse and leading him into battle. And the next day, he got up and he told his troops, you know, I think St. James is on our side. And then he said, look, there he is. And, and they followed St. James into battle and won. So what happened is they co-opted and militarized St. James. And in this, this is a statue in the Cathedral of Santiago, which is processes on saints' days. He's shown not only dismembering the bodies of Muslims, but he's also a pilgrim with his leather hat and his pilgrim's cloak. It's, so this shows you bringing together the pilgrim as militant, the pilgrim as part of this militant battle, um, and uh, the notion of the polarization of Muslims and Christians of right and wrong. Here's a later one, of, of slightly, uh, a, a later one, in which the Muslims are starting to look like <laughs> Ottomans and Mamluks. That is, the, 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 the Muslims that St. James fights against can endlessly become the ones who you are living with in your time. And my favorite one is in the Cathedral of Burgos. It's a really powerful one, and the horse has. OK, so the road became lucrative. New, new, new settlements, new settlements uh, go up. And it also becomes the means by which a lot of um, not only French lay people, but, um, but uh, French monastic groups become involved in, um, in, in, in the pilgrimage roads. And one of them is the great monastery of Cluny, sort of like, um, sort of like it's, it's, it's more powerful than uh, many heads of state, and cer certainly pulling strings with many heads of state. Cluny had received from Spanish monarchs in Castile enormous amounts of money. When they were getting tribute from these small Muslim countries um, to the south, uh, the, the ruler of Castile was sending that money on uh, to the monastery of Cluny and receiving lots of advice. Um, and uh, also, they were receiving guidance. They were trying to get their different styles of monasteries and churches with different styles of liturgy under sort of one cloak. And it was very important for the pope and for the Cluniacs, although they're not always on the same page, to see Spain <coughs> brought under this cloak. Because what's happening, uh, Areas which had been under Muslim domination for a long time were starting to be uh, come Christian rule. And the pope wanted to make sure they were under his control. He didn't want a lot of loose canon Christians getting there, especially the ones that spoke uh, Arabic. And so, um, so the, one of the ways it happened is, the, is, is, is these monastic groups are, are situating themselves on these frontiers. They're helping to settle the frontiers, but they're also helping to reform a, lo a lot of the area. Now, in about the, um, in the, in the uh, first uh, half of the 12th century, this guy, Peter the Venerable of the Monastery of Cluny, and i just show you how big the church is so you can have an idea. Peter the, Peter the Venerable decides he's going to come to Spain. He has a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is, is that the Spanish monarch, Alfonso VII, has stopped giving all that gold. And he's going to come down and try to make him feel kind of guilty. He's trying to broker a, a wedding. And also he says, and he tells us, I am going to come down and I'm going to commission a translation of the Quran. And when I read it, I'll know so that I can better refute those Muslims. 
Well, there's a lot of translation happening in the city of Toledo in Spain, even though the city of Toledo is ruled by, um, is ruled by Christians. And there's scholars coming from all over the Europe. They can't wait to get their hands on some of those manuscripts that have been preserved in, uh, in Islamic libraries. When they were being destroyed in Christian libraries, manuscripts of Aristotle, of Ptolemy, of you know, the, great, um, the, the great geometricians and scientists, the great, uh, the great, the, the great medicinal manuscripts, um, agriculture, and philosophical manuscripts, and, and, and scholars are dying to get their hands on them. And one senses that at Cluny, where there were many intellectuals, there was more than just a strict desire to refute. There was a deep curiosity. So Peter the Great comes down, and, and Alfonso VII says, I can't give you like wagon loads of gold like my grandfather did, but I will give you this little monastery, this kind of monastery that's on hard times. You can have it. It's called San Pedro de Cardenia. And he gives them San Pedro de Cardenia, and Peter, Peter the Venerable goes, and they kick out all the Spanish monks and tells them they're probably heretics because they've been, they have a, they have a weird liturgy. liturgy. Okay, they kick out the Spanish monks, monks and, 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 and he puts Cluniac monks there, and then they rebuild the cloister. And look how they rebuild it. Exotic. Now, what's interesting is, what's, in, what's, interesting, what's interesting is, is this kind of, exotic and polarized aesthetic is more interesting to the French than to the Spanish in a funny way. Now among the things at Cardenia that are interesting to know is that there's a horse buried there. This is the horse's grave. The horse's name is Babieca, which means stupid. <laughs> and it was the horse of El Cid. Now the reason I'm showing, I, I consider these to be comparable images. <laughs> and they're comparable images because they both show El Cid in his sort of, um, they both show El Cid in his sort of a, a, a mythic stance. El Cid, the great Spanish warrior, the, you know, the, the, the first Spaniard, and he's, he was like one of the early Castilians, which meant he was a rough rider, he was, a, he was an independent guy, he wasn't, he wasn't too effete, um, <clears throat> and he married Sophia Loren. And, <laughs> and, and, this is, the, the, this is the statue of El Cid, and of course, he's imagined by many as being this great warrior against the Muslims. But of course, if you read the story of El Cid, you know his, um, he worked for Muslims. When he left his own lands, his Muslim feudal, his, his, his feudal dependents cried because he had been so good, good to them. You know, he lived in a much more ambivalent world. That world was much more ambivalent. People, uh, people had, People, lived, people who lived among Muslims could not polarize from them so easily. Nevertheless, nevertheless, what's interesting is if you go to the monastery of Cardenia in the Baroque period later on, it's of course now very famous because El Cid was buried there for a while, also Jimena, his, his wife, but Cardenia lost, the, they, they became too important, so they lost those bodies and they got stuck just with the horse. But, <laughs> When you see the when you see the um, the main portal, it's really interesting. This design of red and white, which we now know is the sign of Islam or Islamic exoticism, is here as a kind of trophy of war. And in the center is an image of El Cid looking just like Santiago, with a horse trampling Muslims under his under his hooves. That is, that is Rodrigo Vivar. The real El Cid was not like that. And even in the, the song, the Cantar de Mio Cid, it's not like that. But now this is what he becomes, because he becomes a national symbol about Spain, or as about certain Spanish groups, or about Castile as being uniquely Christian. All of this is along the road, and it's part of the French appropriation of the road, and the French attempt to make this bipolar opposition between Christians and Muslims. So that these items that you find along the road, these beautiful images, these beautiful, um, these beautiful say boxes, these beautiful boxes created in um, the created in the Islamic world, are appropriated. Now, this box is, is studied by one of the great um, pilgrimage road scholars, um, uh, Elizabeth Valdez Alamo and, and Constantio del Alamo. Um, it's a box that in the, that's in the church of Santo Domingo de Silos. And it's, it is a, a gorgeous taifa box that is from the taifa 
from the type of kingdom. And there was obviously one panel missing. And so in the monastery, they replaced it with an enamel panel. And the enamel panel shows their, shows their saint, Santo Domingo. He's one of those saints who frees prisoners. That becomes very important. And you can imagine him freeing poor Christian prisoners in the hands of Muslims. That's one of the things he's supposed to have done. And yet here again, we see that kind of tension and ambivalence. There's a real admiration for the handiwork and the craft of this Muslim box. Um, look at they've preserved the main, um, they've preserved the main inscription. And yet it then it's sort of neutralized. It's Muslim, it's Muslim part is sort of neutralized by this image that says, well, you know, yeah, it's pretty nice. But Santo Domingo is going to free all their prisoners. And as a matter of fact, reliquary. Now, what do reliquary have? They have relics, the, the, most precious, the most precious thing you could have along the pilgrimage road are relics that are in reliquaries. They're the, they're the bones of the saints. They're what people come to see. These relics um, embody, uh, embody the kind of magic that, that, that is your cathartic um, reward for the pilgrimage. And yet, these reliquaries are, are almost all lined with Islamic textiles. Some of them have, some of them have um, inscriptions that say, you know, there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. <laughs> and, and that was not problematic, because you could think of it as a spoil of war, right? You could think of it as a piece of spolia. But whenever that happens, there's that tension, that ambivalence, <laughs> something that's admired. One of the reasons we know that is that some things which were not in the hands of church, uh, uh, of the church, this is a, a pillow that belonged to a Castilian queen named Berenguela. And it, has, it was made in Almeria. It was probably ordered from an, is, an Islamic country. And it has two girls, Kian, dancing girls. Now, Kian, um, Kian were these dancing girls who held the whole tradition of um, Arabic poetic dancing. They knew po poetry, which they sang as songs. They were often taken as booty of war. You know, part of the courtly love tradition was probably deeply influenced in Aquitaine by Kion, who were captured at the at the siege of Sara, of, at the siege of of, of, Sa, of Saragossa. And there are funny stories about um, people loving their Kion so much that that they ended up becoming uh, more Islamic in style than the Kion became Christian in style. But those are those are those are legends. But what we're seeing here is. What we're seeing here is not a bipolar opposition, not good and bad, not black and white, not evil. That, that there's one discourse, which is the discourse created for pilgrimage, and then there's the other discourse that's happened every day. And here are those two, here are those two worlds. In fact, a lot of the Iberian Peninsula, below the area where the pilgrimage road was, um, had a kind of interaction which was often tense. People were often resentful. They didn't always like each other, but they sometimes did. And this is an idyllic image. This is a 13th century image from a book of Alfonso X, the man I showed you in the beginning, of a Christian and a Muslim, uh, a Christian and a Muslim playing instruments together with the whole implication of interaction. Then if that's the case, then these images of Santiago Matamoros were in a way a mask for that a mask so that there could be some kind of pretense of a world of black and white, a world of good and bad, a world of cosmic opposition. And that was so particularly important for the pilgrimage roads. Of course, it's that cosmic op opposition that led to Ferdinand and Isabel, that led to the notion of the Catholic kings, that led to the notion of a Spain whose identity was uniquely Christian, and that led to the Inquisition, obviously. But I digress. When I first went, when I first went to Santiago in 1976, 1976, yes, 1976, Franco was still in power, and Santiago was perceived of as a military saint. On St. James Day, there was a procession of tanks through the city, and these young men, who now just wear bugles and look clean cut, um, were playing quite militant songs. Santiago was on the books of the Spanish army as a colonel. And I always wondered, wouldn't like, you know, he's a saint, could you make him a general? I mean, <laughs> would it have cost so much? I don't know. But 
but he was a military saint. And you can see what's, you can see what's encased in this. Uh, uh, Franco, of course, Franco, of course, was devoutly Catholic, but devoutly invested in the notion, the Ferdinand and Isabel notion, that Spain would be a Catholic, a Catholic kingdom. Um, it, there, was a, there, was suppression, there was suppression of any alternative identities, and certainly Judaism and Islam, not to mention uh, just alternate uh, reg 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 regional identities. And Santiago became the way that he focused in on that. And so the same value. Now, what happens today when you come on St. James Day? Well, it's different. Today, Today, on the night of the 25th, they set up a false facade in front of the Cathedral of Santiago that goes up in fireworks, and it goes up in fireworks you know, at midnight, the night before St. James Day. There's no, there are no military parades anymore. But when I went in 1976, this was the false facade in front of the cathedral. Does it look familiar? It looks a lot like this, doesn't it? Or like this. It looks like that and like that. It looks like that and like that because at midnight it went up in flames. At midnight it went up in flames like the hidden alter ego, like the evil alter ego of the Spanish psyche. It burned up and you became a pure Christian kingdom on 1201, July 26. This kind of thinking which believes that your identity can reside in only one religion, in only one point of view, with no ambivalence. That kind of thinking which created the Crusades and created also the, the Inquisition was very, much, was very much part of one part of the Crusader, Crusader experience. Today it's, today, it's a lot more humane. Today, this Santiago, this Santiago is a part of folklore, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's an almost nauseatingly global ex experience today. But the important thing for us is when we see Santiago, de, de Santiago Matamoros, we see one part of Spain trying to, trying to suppress the part of Spanish identity which was multiple, which was messy, and which was ambiguous. Um, I'm certainly glad that's not there anymore. Thank you. <laughs>